My name is Celia Espinosa and I am from Idaho and uh, the reason I felt the call to go out to Standing Rock was because I live in a beautiful state um, and my kids, we go camping and fishing and it, it just became personal um, and I felt the need to, to come out and help um, and so that's how it started. So I, um, in my community, I started a donation drive um, and we gathered donations and we brought them out to Standing Rock in November, and then we came back to Idaho and did it again in December. Um, and since then, we've had rallies, um, candlelight vigils, um, the screenings of Awake, um, just anything to keep people aware of what's happening at Standing Rock. Um, in June, there was an opening at Freshet Collective, and they are a collective that um, during Sacred Stone, um, they had a legal fund and people donated about $4 million to this fund, which then became Freshet Collective. Um, what they do is they work with um, people who got arrested at Sanding Rock. There were over 800 arrests during the time. And uh, currently we have about over 500 cases that are still open. And so what we do is we prioritize, we have a list of people that we work with, um, specifically indigenous uh, minorities um, that we will house and provide travel for to come out for their court dates. Um, we also help with uh, finding attorneys free of charge, so none of that has to come out of their pocket. Fresh It takes care of all of that. And so that's what I do. So did the, um, and it's... How do you spell it? F R E S H E T Collective. Can you tell us how that, how did the name come about? Did it exist before it was created for this as an entity? Um, it it was created that? for it, and I guess Fresh It is like a stream of water. That's the definition of it, and so they felt that that would be appropriate to name it since water is life. And it's beautiful, and it unfortunately also sounds like Fresh Shit. <laughs> fresh net fre I mean there's so many names for it yeah we've actually <laughs> we've actually thought about like changing it just to something more indigenous sounding it's an indigenous led collective so but it, we just haven't gotten there yet yeah yeah it, you know you've got so much work to do definitely right? um could I take you back to Standing Rock a little bit and talk about it and then we could you know, fast forward to the work you're doing now because sure. it's critically important. We know Absolutely. That Rock has fallen out of the media and a lot of people's right. consciousness, and we need to bring it back. Um, but to do that, sort of tapping into when you first went out, you said in November. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about you know the first time you drove to camp. And oh my goodness! What what you saw, what it looked like to you, what are the things you, if you can, kind of find that memory it's implanted like so we went there right after the October 27th treaty camp raid that was at the backwater bridge and <clears throat> people were still very affected by that in fact as we drove in um, it was really emotional I mean we drove in at six in the morning and I just remember hearing the drums and hearing the morning prayer and I was bawling like at the security gate. I just couldn't believe that we had made it there. I mean, all the teepees, the tents, it was beautiful. Um, but as we drove in, on the right side, you would see the sacred fire. And on the left side, there was a pile of items that had like, like they'd been destroyed and just laying over tarps people's things had been destroyed at the treaty camp by the that by the huge, police that huge pile and and you heard some of the things they said they what they did to them yeah yeah i mean if you got close enough you could smell them and it just became so much more real i mean you i was watching from 1500 miles away and to see it from my own eyes i mean that camp had so much spirit and even now um, driving out there when I got here um, you could still feel it. Did you stop? It took me a month but I did. I, I got here in June and I couldn't 
I couldn't drive down 1806. I, I just couldn't do it. And um, one of my water protector friends was having a really hard day. She found out that someone had um, committed suicide, another water protector, and just really hard day. And so I just felt the need to go out there. And so I did it, ended up, I had taken a bundle of sage that she actually gave me and just walked down Flag Road and came back up and and went up to the backwater bridge. And um, on my way back from there, there was like some sage growing. So I took some and took it back to her. What did it look like to you like as you came back to it? So it was just recent. It's pretty, pretty it's green. It's so green and beautiful, but you can still, really, if you sit there, you can still see where everything's at. You can still see everything. Like I stayed in several different camps. We stayed by Winona's kitchen, and, you know, I just remember everything that was there and just Flag Road, like, those flags never went away. That's yeah, Flag Road was the single most powerful thing I ever. Absolutely. I still, you know, just the, every flag representing a people, a nation. Um, yeah, it's like, yeah, it, they're going to just fly there forever. Like, you can just, like, the, even though the road just looks like a little dirt road that disappears in the grass. Yeah. Like, um. So wow, you came right after the Backwater Bridge, November. Yeah. Um, when you and you said you said you camped in different places. Um, and so when we went in November, we camped um, right below Facebook Hill, um, just a few feet away from Winona's kitchen. We just had a U-Haul and our car, and we just stayed in the U-Haul once we emptied it out and took the donations everywhere. Um, but I remember seeing men still shook up by what had happened. And that was really, like, to see a man still, you know, crying about it, it was just, it was real, just so real. But there was so much work to do. I remember there were always actions. I never went to the actions. We kind of, my ex and I kind of promised each other that we weren't going to do that because we have kids and we just, we're gonna go there and help because that's what originally what you went for. There were days where I was like, I'm, I'm going, I don't care, I need to be on the front lines, but no, I, I didn't do it. Um, but just being able to cook for people, because that's what I did, I worked at Winona's Kitchen, and so just being able to cook for the people that were just coming back from actions, it was just, it was beautiful, really beautiful. We met a lot of people. And the, the camp, was a massive. It was a. It was a small city. Yeah, it was. Right? It was a small city of indigenous values in action and decolonizing happening. Um, are there any specific moments or memories that you have of something where you're like, oh, "Gee, I might never see that again," or "That's always going to stay with me," or any 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 bits or pieces where, and or or things that surprised you too. Um, just a sense of community. I feel like we as civilization these days, we're so disconnected, you know, and out there it's very rare that any, any, anyone had service. I mean, I, was, I would have to sit in the port of John to be able to talk to my kids. It was just the, the sense of community. I left up my keys on the U-Haul all day, didn't even know it. You know, in the evening, I came back and I had to get something from my car and I was looking everywhere for those keys and they were sitting on the U-Haul. Like, you can't really go anywhere these days without something going missing. In fact, we had tables of our items here, and right next to them there was a table of free stuff. Please take this. None of our stuff ever got touched. You know, it, the, just the respect and everybody helping everybody. If you needed anything, it was there. Manifestations happened all the time. I would worry about, oh, we're running out of something, when I would say, don't worry about it, we'll get few minutes later someone would run up and say do you need this and this and I'm like that's exactly what I needed <laughs> so it was just so beautiful just seeing people show up and helping you know in the winter time putting buildings together in like you know negative 20 degree weather the blizzards lightning during a blizzard I mean so you spirit was definitely there 
that alone, I mean, and I think that's what that feeling is, is like just spirit that you can't imitate. I mean, we have this water protector camp here. We're all together, but it doesn't feel the same. Yeah. What do you think, um, what, how did you become involved after Standing Rock? You know, you mentioned that you did some activity, you know, that you, you came back in December and then you were, you were doing, because that was a thing, it's like Standing Rock was a spirit, you, could, you can try, you know, you have to really work hard, but you get to take, to take it with you, yeah. because it's hard to nurture it outside of right. that space, as you just said. Um, tell me about sort of what got you involved with working on the legal, on the legal struggle. <clears throat> After leaving Standing Rock both times, and one time I was only there for less than a week, and the other time we were there for two weeks. So we weren't there very long, but you found yourself having to relearn going back to, like, into the matrix or something. It was just, it was really difficult for me to go back to my 9 to 5 and to focus. Like, I was, you know, watching live streams when I was supposed to be working or, you know, just um, at the end of my job where I was working at, I remember her telling me, you just need to go work for a nonprofit. And I was like, you're so right. I, I need to get out of this, just all of this. Um, so I was at home just thinking about what I was going to do next because I was also kind of burnt out by, you know, the lack of support. You know, people in Idaho were like, the Women's March, yeah, we're all for it. You know, we had a big rally um, for Shining Rock and there were like 300 people that showed up. But then after that, like it slowly died down, you know. And so after that, I just thought there was something else I needed to do. And so Tara from Honor the Earth had posted, yes, she had posted this job opening for Fresh It. And I told my ex, who has been very supportive from the get-go, um, I, I asked him if this, if, you know, if I applied for this, would he be okay with it? And he said, of course. And um, so he's now at home with my three teenagers, being Mr. Mom, allowing me to be out here doing this work, which I feel just is so important. It's just another, another piece of what, you know, I feel like I'm meant to be doing right now. So you changed, you changed your whole life. Absolutely. That's really <laughs> powerful. What would you like uh, folks to know right now from what you're seeing and experiencing with the legal struggle. What do people need to be thinking or doing or talking about in, in connection to it? That's a really hard one. Definitely reaching out to each other. If they know that one of their fellow water protector friends is in need of you know any type of representation, you know, to turn them in our direction. Uh, Fresh It doesn't really advertise, that's why I'm here, just trying to get the word out that we exist. I didn't even know who Fresh It was before I applied, had no idea. I thought it was just Water Protector Legal Collective, so. Um, but as far as, I don't know how you want to add this or not, but I think if, if there's other struggles happening, other um, pipeline fights, I would recommend that they um, reach out to one of the legal collectives out there and try to get training before they go out and put themselves on the line and risk getting arrested. Um, I know that we're working on trying to put something together where um, other, other um, camps have something like that in place. But getting educated before they go and put their lives on the line. Such a huge community organizing endeavor and it's really hard to do when the energy gets lost or dissipated or diverted from Standing Rock and um, you know I think that yeah I was I was telling you before about you know like the the history of these legal collectives in Indian country and and how there's not much about them out there right, right? they're basically in the grandmas and grandpas that are walking right. around um, so I think this will be a first step in helping, like the more we are, you know, people watch it and add their story to it. Um, 
when it comes to water protectors like who are struggling right now, um, I think it's, it's hard because we know that the place will never exist again as we knew it. But um, you, you, know, you mentioned a loss already that sounds deeply, deeply indescribably painful. Um, what are the things that you'd like folks to know about those who were there as water protectors and who are struggling now to sort of fit in, or those folks who are struggling, if there's anything you could say to them. After Standing Rock, I would get phone calls at 2, 3 in the morning from water protectors that just were lost and didn't know where to go and what to do. And it really, it really hurt me because I don't know what, I don't know what to say sometimes or, or what direction to point them to. So I've been really working hard trying to find, you know, mental health professionals, healers. Um, we brought a water protector out to Idaho and we took him up to the mountains and just had him clear his head. He went and saw a therapist after that. But I think especially in men who are very prideful sometimes and just keep things to themselves, it's really hard for them to talk about these things. I encourage them to to say something, to reach out to the people that were there that can relate. It's difficult to talk to a stranger about something that only the people that were there can feel and can relate to. Um, that's another part of my work there with Fresh It is just trying to find connections to those people. Um, so, I mean, if, if anyone is in need of that, Definitely reach out to us, reach out to, I would say reach out to other water protectors, definitely, um, and not keep it inside. Are there any, uh, anything you guys want to ask? Um, yeah. Okay, um, I just had a couple questions. Because um, you mentioned having kids and calling them from here, so obviously I take it they didn't come in. Go ahead. Um, how do you instill like the activist mindset in them and try to get them to kind of follow, follow your footsteps in the way of making a difference in your community and supporting these kinds of things? Well, I mean, as a mother first, I never really looked at it as like something I want to instill in them. I, I want my kids to follow what they think, you know, they want to do with life, right? Um, I think just watching like the organizing going on and them being with me in our town when we were putting together different, um, you know, different um, events, really they started to see, you know, networking, how that works, you know, getting in touch with, you know, certain people to get things done. Um, I have a transgender kid and he's kind of followed his own LGBT, you know, um, with his LGBT struggle, he's found his own um, activism, right? Because there's so much of that that's needed for that. And so he started his own little youth group and that kind of thing that started from a senior project. So I think that they all have like, they all have it in them to want to do that, want to help somehow. So, and one of my kids actually did get to go out with us, um, my youngest and Man, she learned a lot. She learned a lot. She always sat with the elders and just sat there and listened. And I mean, I think that's the biggest lesson to take from there, just to listen. Yeah, it was really valuable. And then I had another question. Could you remind me of when in November and October you went to Stanley? So I went November, we went the weekend of November 4th. So we were there for about five days. And then the second time we went, uh, December, it was over uh, Christmas break. So we went like the end of, we actually got there uh, Christmas Eve and we left right after New Year. So you would have been there during the election and the voting and the results. And those were two very different candidates. And I know that there was a lot riding on that campaign with the pipeline. I wasn't sure if the election affected the morale of the camp and what that was like being here during that or if what was going on here was so consuming that that didn't really play a role. I have to say that in December the energy had shifted and I think it was just the fact that there were less people in camp um, and it was very cold and so that really I think people went into survival mode 
And so, it, you know, it, the, the energy was definitely different. Still beautiful. Um, yeah, but it had shifted a lot. And I don't know if it, I don't, I wouldn't say it had to do with the elections. I think it was just like, what direction are we going, you know, at that point? And I know we, you, you talk a lot about shifts, and I know that when you said that you first went to Standing Rock, um, the main reason was that you felt you had to go. And I know that from what you told us, there's a lot of evolution in your emotions and your perspectives. What kind of, as a way to spark that and try to convey that emotion, what do you think now is the main reason why you continue to do this, why you continue to, uh, to be part of this, uh, this part of its activism, this kind of thing? Standing Rock changed my life. I am not the same person I was a year ago. Um, the day that I decided I needed to do something to help was like a whole new chapter. And since then, just the, the friendships and um, relationships that have developed. I mean, this is like family now. It's not even, it, you know, I, I come out here and I'm not alone ever, you know. Um, I, I honestly just feel like I need to give back. That's, that's where I'm at. I need to help. I need to see it through. Um, whatever that looks like. And if there's something else that's going to happen along these lines later on down the road, I, I mean, at this point, I've already gone this far. I can't really turn around and go back home and pretend it never happened. So. They say you can't unknow. Exactly. Once, once you know. And, and it's our responsibility. Once you know that, yeah, you definitely can unknow it, and it's your responsibility to, like, see it through. Um, yeah, definitely my kids, I, I think about their future and, you know, what they're going to have left once we're gone and, you know, it's up to me now to do something. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I don't know if we want to include, like, I don't know how old this is or when this is going to get out, but just about Fresh It, if, do we need to give contact information? Cause yeah, it's um, freshitcollective.org, um, and then we have the phone number as well, but we're also um, on Facebook, Water Protector Legal Collective. I'm sorry, Water, Protect Water Protector Arrestee Support. Okay. Very different from the other one. You can edit it. It's so, yeah, we work together, but we don't. It's just two different entities. They're the attorneys, and we're more like the logistical side.